one of the scariest enemies the Federation would ever encounter, the Borg Collective would come to be symbolized by its most prominent starship design, the Borg Cube. But what do we know about this fear-inspiring design? Well, today we'll find out. Hello and welcome to another episode of Truth or Myth Beta Canon, a Star Trek web series that dives into the history of any given topic using Beta Canon sources and my own imagination to fill in the gaps. In today's episode, we're continuing our spooktacular starship event for the month of October by taking a look at the single most scariest enemy starship design ever created, the Borg Cube, as first seen in Star Trek The Next Generation, to better understand its place in Star Trek history. But of course, and as always, because this is just a bit of beta canon, all information relayed should pretty much be taken with a grain of stardust, and only considered a little bit of Star Trek fun. And so, with all that out of the way, let's begin. No enemy ever encountered in the Milky Way galaxy can compare to the horror instilled by the Borg Collective. An untold fortune of drones, all forcefully assimilated from conquered alien races, and all connected to a hive mind was unlike anything the Federation had ever encountered before. Central to the operation of the hive mind within the collective was the Borg Queen. Essentially a physical representation of the hive mind, she would control every aspect of the Borg with ruthless efficiency. It is unclear exactly when the Borg Collective came into existence. But one thing is certain, the Borg were the scariest enemy ever faced by the Federation. On Stardate 42761.3, the omnipotent being known as Q, in an effort to teach humanity a lesson it needed to learn before it was too late, flung the USS Enterprise D, flagship of the Federation, to System J25, where Captain Jean-Luc Picard and the crew of the heroic starship would first encounter the Collective. Detecting a cube-shaped vessel in the sector, the Enterprise would quickly discover that their missing outposts along the neutral zone had been the work of this new galactic player, and also just how unprepared for this new enemy the Federation truly was. Once back in Federation space, the Enterprise would report back to Starfleet Command, and Starfleet Command perhaps out of its own hubris, or simply a belief that it had far more time than it actually did, would begin to debate courses of action and strategies for their eventual contact with the Borg. With an almost lackadaisical attitude, Starfleet would begin several projects to fight this new enemy. But when a year later, and a single Borg cube was discovered heading directly for Sector 001, Starfleet basically had nothing ready to defend itself with, and this would lead to the loss of 39 vessels and over 11,000 lives at the Battle of Wolf 359. The Borg Collective had many starship designs in its fleet, with most resembling simple geometric shapes. But of course, there was nothing simple about Borg starship designs and technology. Of course, the main staple of the Borg fleet would be the Borg Cube. Sitting at a length of 3,037 meters, the Borg Cube was designed to be operated by up to 130,000 Borg drones. All systems within the Borg Cube were decentralized, meaning that should a component of a certain system fail, for any reason, others would simply take over with no loss of power or function. The Borg Cube had a standard safe cruising speed of warp factor 9.99, although it would often travel at speeds less than warp 9.5 during regular operations. With no maximum emergency speed, the Borg Cube also had a transwarp drive. This gave the Borg Collective a clear advantage over the Federation, as from their home in the Delta Quadrant, the Borg Collective could send vessels to attack the Federation in a fraction of the time it would take for a Federation starship to reach Borg space. When traveling at transwarp velocities, the Borg Cube would project a structural integrity field ahead of itself to compensate for extreme gravimetric shear, while at the same time also projecting a chroniton field to compensate for the extreme temporal stress 
and keep the vessel in temporal sync with the outside universe. Tactically, the weaponry of the Borg Cube was also far superior than the best that Starfleet had to offer. 36 adaptive weapons arrays and 12 focused neutron beam banks would comprise the primary arsenal of the cube, while 24 shield-draining tractor beam emitters, along with shield-draining pulse launchers, would add to the fierce weaponry of these vessels. The Borg Cube did not utilize traditional energy shields. Instead, they employed a subspace electromagnetic field that could be altered to adapt to an enemy's weapon systems. This made destroying Borg vessels extremely difficult, as most weapons used against them tended to either not work at all or to become completely useless after only a few shots. Information and collective communication were routed through power waveguide conduits and distribution nodes, again allowing for superior response times and adaptability to all situations. After the Battle of Wolf 359, the Borg would make several attempts to re-enter the Alpha and Beta Quadrants in order to gain a foothold in those areas. The Battle of Sector 001 and the Romulan Borg engagement are but a few instances where the Borg were outwitted by their opponents who they had underestimated. Thankfully, the Borg Collective as we knew it no longer exists. Thanks to the efforts of Captain Jean-Luc Picard and Captain Catherine Janeway in the 2370s, the Borg Collective would become a shell of its former self. Although in 2401, the Borg Queen would make one last play to assimilate the Federation. But now, Admiral Jean-Luc Picard and his former command crew, utilizing a restored Enterprise D, would finally put the last nail in the Borg's coffin ending that chapter for the Borg Collective once and for all. However, it should be noted that another faction of the Borg Collective was recently discovered to exist. This Borg faction, however, does not forcefully assimilate cultures, but rather accepts volunteers into its collective and has offered its hand of friendship to the Federation. Exactly how this entire situation will play out in the long run has yet to be seen. But for now, the Milky Way galaxy can sleep tight knowing that this gruesome and frightening enemy is no more. Created as the perfect vessel to assimilate the galaxy, the Borg Cube inspired fear into all who were unlucky enough to behold it, earning the Borg Cube its frightening place in Starfleet history. Thank you for watching today's episode of Truth or Myth Beta Canon. What do you think of the Borg Cube, the Borg Collective, and the historical narrative that I've created here? Do you want to see more videos like this one? Well, leave your comments in the section below. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, hitting that little bell icon so you won't miss a single video we release. Want to help the channel continue to assimilate Star Trek fans into its collective? Then consider becoming a channel patron a major help that allows this channel to purchase resources and 3D models to keep it going. The link to our Patreon account is in the description below. Thanks again for watching, and remember, resistance isn't so futile.